All right, guys, it's that time. Um, I'm gonna we'll we'll just kind of go over some of the details and give people a couple more minutes to jump in. I always try to start just a couple minutes late in case there are any latecomers. But welcome, welcome. Um, my name is Jennifer McInnes. I'm with SDI. Joining me tonight is Kip Carpenter. We're gonna take you through kind of a step-by-step -step process, um, spitball a little bit on how to grow your gunsmithing business or firearms business um, from the ground up as far as both an on-ground type of, uh, for lack of a better term, old school perspective. And Kip is the pro there, much, much better at it than I am. Um, and then also kind of the virtual online side of it as well. Um, and that's where I'll kind of be chiming in. So this is my first time on this side of the webinar uh, panel here. Um, bear with me for tonight. But I do have a couple polls. We've got one up right now. Um, thank you, everybody, who has chimed in. If you're just now joining us, couple little housekeeping issues here. Um, I've got a poll in progress right now. If you logged in and you saw it, um, go ahead and vote for me. I love to see this kind of thing. So far, it's looking like the majority of people. The question is, do you already own a firearms business? Um, and so far, 66% of you that have chimed in already hope to start a firearms business within about a year, um, if, if not less than that. And then uh, quite a few of you, 22% own your own gunsmithing shop but operate out of your home. Just 5% operate outside of a home but do own your own gunsmithing business. Um, and then just 2% of you own or manage a different firearms business, not necessarily your own. And a couple of you don't even plan to start a firearms business, so I guess you're just here for the party. So. Um, Second thing I wanted to, and, and please keep chiming in, if you haven't had a chance to vote on that yet, I love to see that kind of thing. This will actually kind of help us decide uh, which directions to take with this conversation, so super helpful. Um, also, if you have questions for Kip or for me throughout this whole thing, pop, up, pop on over to the questions section. You should be able to see that in your little go-to webinar dashboard over there. Um, and uh, put them in there. I'm going to keep an eye on it as we talk. Um, and I'll interject your questions as we go along. So, without further ado, we've given everybody a little bit of chance to, to get in and set up. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to go ahead and get us started. At, for those of you who've never had a webinar with us before, in fact, has anybody here, if you haven't, if this is your first webinar, I know we saw at least one or two of you guys earlier chime in and say, hey, this is my first one. Um, if it is your first one, first of all, welcome. Second of all, if you wouldn't mind, pop on over to that question sec uh, section over there. Let me know where you heard about us or if it is your first time. Thanks, Brian, for being here. I really, really appreciate it. Um, and obviously all my repeat offenders as well. So um, for those of you who don't know how this works, we're going to go over a little bit of information on SDI, a little bit of information on Kip and I, and then we'll dive in. I promise I'll keep it short. Um, in case you guys don't know much about the school, we are a DEAC accredited online, online firearms school. Um, last I checked, we have students in all 50 states, which is so cool. Um, we offer only on uh, online at home study options. So you never have to leave, you never have to pick up and move to go to school. Um, we're built to kind of work with your schedule. So if you're active duty, if you're full time working, um, we want to make sure that you have that flexibility to still learn something that you're passionate about. Um, for us, when you see the programs and courses, they're listed. Uh, and if you need any information on this, um, I'll put some, some information at the bottom as well on how to get more information. But um, we have two programs that are approved for use of TA and VA benefits. That's the Associate of Science in Firearms Technology degree. It's our biggest program. Um, the Advanced Gunsmithing Certificate is also approved for use of most TA and VA benefits. Um, both of those also include a build option through your capstone program. Um, and I'll talk more about those in just a second here. We have a ballistics and reloading certificate program, a course rather that um, is super cool. It's in conjunction with Gun Digest and Hornady. Um, you get a whole Hornady lock and load press out of that one. It's specific to ballistics. And then we do also have three advanced armor course options as well, AR-15, AR-10, 19, 11 platforms. Um, those can be taken as standalone courses or as part of, like I said before, the associate degree program or the advanced gunsmithing certificate. Um, quick note, the associate degree is now also approved to participate in Title IV funding and federal student aid for eligible students only, obviously. You have to go through that process, um, but that is an option now for the first time ever, so we're pretty excited about that. Um, we do also have these extra externship opportunities available, say that three times fast. 
Um, they're called field studies. If you want more information, I've put the email address down there. You'll talk to Anna Moody. She's awesome. Um, we have 12 or 13 options, I believe, nationwide now as far as on-site locations. Um, and we can absolutely get you info on all of them. They're usually two to four week externships. You get a ton of hands-on training. Um, they come at no additional cost to the student, but you do have to pay your way to get there and stay there for the two to four weeks. So if you can handle that, we it's no additional cost to the students. It's just a way to kind of set yourself apart from everybody else. So um, that's SDI in a nutshell. Now if you have questions, I think, oh, I guess I haven't put that down there, but um, the best email address for that is admissions, A-D-M-I-S-S-I-O-N-S, -S -S uh, at sdi.edu, sierradeltaindia.edu, or you can just email me, Jennifer, at sdi.edu as well. So, Kip, I'm going to let you talk about yourself, because you always do such a good job. Um, <laughs> Kip is one of our favorite instructors. Don't tell the other instructors I said that. <laughs> um, but he has, he's been awesome in helping me out with these webinars for the last couple months here. So, Kip, tell us a little bit about how you got into the industry, when you got started, um, that type of thing. Give me the whole history. Well, it started actually quite a long time ago. Um, it actually started when I was pretty much pretty much around nine or ten years old. Uh, my dad used to take me to the range, and he used to shoot a, a little Ruger 22 pistol, and just fell in love with it. Loved to shoot and loved to target shoot. And from there, naturally, as any boy would, I kind of got into hunting and things like that, and had an interest there. But I just really enjoyed shooting, and I loved guns. So uh, at 14 years old. Uh, Actually, back me back up a little bit there. Around around 11 years old, we moved into a neighborhood, and I had became friends with one of the neighbor's uh, sons, and we became best friends. And his dad just happened to be a gunsmith. So, with that in play, and him and my dad became very good friends. So, next thing I know, uh, we were shooting all the time. If it weren't with my dad, we were with his dad. Uh, fishing, uh, shooting, that kind of stuff. And at 14 years old, he started teaching us some serious gunsmithing. And he would come home, um, usually on Wednesday night, bring some type of new fire home, or firearm home or something we were interested in in a box in pieces and say, okay, guys, you want to go shooting? Have it ready by Sunday or Saturday morning. So that's how it all kind of came about for uh, me and his son, and really got started there. And it was the same with reloading. He taught us how to reload, so we reloaded our, our uh, planking shells that we'd go out and shoot and that kind of thing. That's that's really how it started for me, and uh, it just kept progressing and progressing and progressing as I became an adult. And I just kept doing it and would read book after book, uh, study, go to seminars, anything I could do to learn more, I did. And I would always work on my friends' guns, family's guns, you know, that kind of thing. Didn't really think about starting a business then at that point. Uh, it didn't come till later in life. And I, as I progressed and went into different trades, I was in law enforcement for a while, then I went into high-risk security was in dignitary protection, and I was always the armor for you know every every organization or every every group I was involved with. So it came from that, and I moved to Tennessee. Uh, went up there for family reasons. My father became very ill. Moved up there and found out that there was just a huge, huge demand for a gunsmith. There's I had taken a couple of guns into someone who thought they were gunsmiths and they weren't and. I thought, you know, I left there saying, I can do better than this. So I opened a business, and in three years went from a small little home shop into my first commercial building within one year. From that, grew into a huge full server shop with a machine shop and, and employees. And that's how, it, that's how it basically started. And, um, you know, it we went really quickly. We went really fast, and that's how I met Zeke and a few other people. And then in 2015, uh, by now, you know, you guys can all figure out I'm a little bit older, so now I'm hitting age 53 years old. Yeah, you're a spring chip. Yeah, yeah, I guess so. And uh, it, it started coming down to it where it was getting bigger than really what I wanted it to. And I always wanted to teach. I've always wanted to uh, have an interest in it because I felt like there was such a need for, for good gunsmiths out there because there's been such a shortage 
you know, there's, there was already millions of guns out there, and it was – it can be a typical demograph. Uh, if you lived in an area – of California or Nevada or, or uh, Florida or anywhere, you can find gun shops, but you can't find gunsmiths. Right. And that that was a real hard thing, and that's that I knew right then. You, you know, there was a big need for that, and I wanted to do what Dave did with me, who taught me how to uh, gunsmith at 14. Uh, he Rick and I, uh, Rick never did pursue it. I did, but he still you know does his thing. And we've talked about this, and you know, it's paid homage to his dad for teaching me. I wanted to be able to teach others, mm -hmm. and Zeke Stout gave me the opportunity in the spring of 2015, and I started part time, and it just started growing fast. And and uh, apparently Zeke and Paul and Sarah were very happy to have me aboard, and kept me going, kept me going, and I decided in uh, winter of 2015 that I wanted to go full time. This is what I wanted to do. I wanted to work for SDI full time and de dedicate my uh, time to doing this kind of work and helping the school grow bigger because I saw such great potential in SDI. And I've been to the other schools. I've been to the online schools. Yeah. And I'm not going to mention names, but you know, you, you know my background. Sure. But but you know, I have all these certifications. I've been to uh, armor schools. I'm an NRA instructor. I'm and all, all different kinds of things. But the one thing that I saw with SDI was this was a great program to get in the door as a beginning gunsmith. And it was also uh, the potential there for from Paul and Zeke to make this go beyond and get even better was there. And I, I just I just really got really got. Um, uh, really into it and want to be part of it and so that's how I got where I'm at. Well and we're happy to have you and, and I've got to say for those of you, we have quite a few students, current students or people that have just started with you Kip on the webinar tonight. <laughs> so, oh great! <laughs> um, the, those, of, those of you who are um, brand new to Kip you'll really like having his class and, and those of you who have chimed in with nice things to say about Kip already Thank you so much, Kip. You and I will have a conversation later about how pe how much people love you. So. <laughs> oh well, well, that's nice to know. That's that's good, but it still doesn't excuse all of you. I want you to study, 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 study. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, cool. So, um, I'm going to advance this slide. I'm a little nervous about this. This this next one's about me here. Um, uh -huh. Okay. So. Um, I'm sure everybody who's been on these for the last year or so knows my voice very well. Um, my name is Jennifer McInnes. I'm the Director of Marketing here at SDI. I've spent 10 years in the higher education industry with um, various colleges, uh, and I find myself really in niche schools, and this has been just my favorite. Um, before I was with the uh, with SDI, I was with a, a, an actual um, golf college, <laughs> so um, I've spent, that was my first, you know, big job out of college, and I've, I've loved it ever since. I really like the education sector. It's something that um, I feel very positively about. It's a, it's a way to kind of change people's lives, so I've really enjoyed it. Um, and my, I started out, for those of you who have enrolled, I started out uh, 10 years ago in an admissions type of role, so um, I kind of enjoy working with students and all of that, but it's morphed over the years, probably the last six to eight years, into more of a marketing position. So um, in addition to the education industry, uh, I took a couple years off and was a marketing consultant for small businesses of different types as well. So you may hear me reference some of that tonight um, when we're talking about branding, growing a business, um, and that type of thing. Uh, I stayed a lot in the medical and legal sector as far as startups go, um, basically from the ground up. So a lot of the companies that I worked for were sole proprietorships, just like you guys are going to be. And they'd come to me and say, all right, I don't know what to do. You know, they gave me this, <laughs> this education. Um, I don't have a website. I don't have a Facebook page. I don't even have business cards. What do I do? Um, and that was kind of my specialty. In addition to that, um, and this is something that uh, we've been very successful with at SDI, um, the social media side of things has been a really fun little part of the industry for me. Um, we do a lot of content marketing, we do a lot of um, client out outreach via email, but social media I feel is really a way for businesses to humanize themselves. And we'll talk about more, we'll talk about that more when we get to my chunk of the things as well, but um, we at SDI have really enjoyed interacting with our students and friends and fans. 
um, on the various social media platforms, especially our Facebook page. If you haven't checked them out yet, go for it. We have a lot of fun there. We try to post really relevant information. Um, it was not Trump University that I worked for, James. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, and, and for those of you asking about the LLC thing, yeah, sole proprietorship can actually be an LLC as well. And, and that type of thing I, I won't get into because that's kind of um, legality type of deal and, and it's kind of between you and your accountant. But yes, yeah, sole proprietorship really just means a, a one-man band. Um, but that can be an LLC. You can incorporate as a sole proprietor. You can do all sorts of stuff. So um, that type of thing you would definitely want to talk to, not so much even a legal team, but more of an accounting team. Um, anyway, sorry for the sorry to digress there. But um, yeah, and so I've been here since pretty much the get-go. We had uh, four years ago, the company changed hands, and that's when I came on. Um, to SDI specifically. So uh, we've seen a lot of growth in a lot of areas. It's been super exciting. We all really like being here. We're very passionate about it. Um, I, I mentioned here, in 2012, which is when this new regime kind of started, um, it was a distance learning school rather than an online school. Um, we kept a lot of the same curriculum, although that has, we have really upgraded and, uh, and updated since then. But they had no social media. They had a very um, small website, paper applications and coursework. You've got your books and your CDs. There was no online way to do things. You would actually fill out your quizzes and tests and then fax them back to, for those of you who are really old school with us, Pam Rogers, who I love dearly. Um, she pretty much ran the ship here. So we had very few enrollments. We had very few programs. We had very few options. Um, and uh, We've grown it a lot since then. We, we really kind of like where we're sitting right now. We have a ton of amazing partners, a ton of amazing students and graduates. Um, so we're, we're just kind of chugging along and having a good time with everything. But that's a little bit of my background. Now, for the rest of this, um, I'm just going to play, just, just going to kind of press play here. Um, you'll see some images. If anybody has any questions on anything, you know, like I said, jot them down in the question and answer session there or section there. Um, but we're going to kind of go off the cuff here a little bit and kind of talk about, I'm going to start with, uh, and Kip, I haven't even talked to you about this, I'm going to start with Kip um, and kind of we're going to walk through um, from a gun guy perspective, how did you come up with the idea to start and how did you get that first segment of customers? Because um, I think that's, that's, a, that's a really scary step for people, you know, once you yeah. make the decision, hey, I want to start this business. Um, actually quitting your job or cutting down on your full-time hours or finding hours elsewhere to find these little part-time um, clients, I think that's a scary part. So if you can walk us through that, we'll start there. Well, yeah, it is scary. Um, I think it's true with any business, but the first thing I want to say is don't quit your job. Don't quit your job when you first start. You just start off small. Um, I am a firm believer, and you know this, Jennifer, I'm a firm believer in the home shop. Mm -hmm. um, it, it starts off, you, you're going to have to get your FFL, and listen, guys, I know you hear all the, the horror stories about FFLs. As long as your county and your city is okay with you having your home business, you're not going to have any problem getting your FFL. The ATF's not going to come in there like stormtroopers, and they're not going to, you know, pin you up against the wall and slap you around. They're not going to do anything <laughs> like that. They're, they're, in fact, they're, the guy that came out with me, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to say his name is Jim Phillips. He was absolutely a great guy, and we ended up being friends. And I can call him even today for anything. Um, he... He, he he explained everything very well to me. There's a, actually there's a lot to go over, and there's a lot to read, and there's a lot to go. But once you get that, now you're legal to charge, okay? But if you don't want to do that at first, you can still gunsmith for your friends and your families and even a customer if you're not charging anything. So if they bring you to part and you're doing it strictly for experience to get going that way, uh, you can start that way. And that starts the spread of word of mouth. Word of mouth is everything in gunsmithing. And I know it is in lots of businesses, but in gunsmithing especially. Uh, for instance, you go down to uh, a mechanic, and we've all, that's something we can all relate to. We've seen good mechanics. We've seen bad mechanics. Same with gunsmiths. If you're a good gunsmith, trust me. 
you will be surprised at how fast that that first knock at the door becomes two knocks at the door becomes three knocks at the door becomes ten knocks at the door it will spread fast uh, you know it's it's like I tell everybody all the time if you do something great for one person in this business and that gun that she's got on there right now that little chief special is a perfect example of what got me going that gun was pitted and was just horrible looking when I got that gun and I hand blew that gun. There's, that's that's something we'll talk about later on, later on. That's something that's a formula that I think only SDI is going to have the privilege to. But you see the end result. When he got that back, that was a police officer. I had three other police officers show up at the house say, "Hey man, can you fix this?" <laughs> <laughs> so and that's really how it just started blooming like that. And I know that, that a lot of you said, "Well." How do I how do I get exposure? Well, the first thing is just to start working. And if you do it for free, that's fine. But if you do, if you are going to charge, get your FFL. And that way you're legal. And that the next step is you know make sure you pay your taxes and all your good stuff. You 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 guys you guys out there are smart. You know exactly how the game's played. Um, the accounting is not as really as expensive as people think it is. Not for a basic little business. Um, in fact, you probably won't have a lot of overhead at all, but you, that's how you really get started. And then go from there. And then, and then as it gets busier, and as you get more, and as you outgrow that shop where you have to buy more tools, you have to get a bigger place, then it's time to consider maybe going part-time or maybe go ahead and hang your shingle and go full-time. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Now, when you first start out, Kip, <clears throat> I, I know that a lot of this, like you said, is word of mouth. How, for you personally, and then we'll talk kind of in, in more generalizations, um, were you handing your business cards out everywhere? Were you going to different organizations? Were you partnering with people? Were you, you know what I mean? Um, sure. Yeah, I, I was the Vista Print King, okay? Uh -huh. <laughs> I, I used Vista Print. I'm not giving a plug, but I mean, it was cheap, <laughs> it was easy. And they had formats where I didn't have to think hard, you know, I just put a basic little card together, stated on there what I could do, how I did it, and just started for spreading the word. And I would go to gun shops. Now, and we'll go into that a little bit further. Um, I may be jumping the gun just a little bit because I know That's you're okay. going to lead to that. But you'll go into um, uh, just, just different areas like pawn shops. Think it. I mean, you just have to really think outside the box. Anyone you meet, give them a card. Give them a card, especially nowadays, man. Just about everybody's got a gun. And, and now that it's become so popular and shooting sports are growing so popular that it's not a taboo thing anymore. And it's like, oh, wow, you're a gunsmith. So, and usually what you'll get is someone will get the card and say, hey, can you work on this or do that? And you'll say, yeah, or, or the next thing out of their mouth will be, you know, I've got this old shotgun with my granddad. He's been sitting in my closet for the last 20 years. You know, <laughs> and I, can, you, can you look at that? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I do a full clo uh, cleaning, inspect. I go through the whole gun. I'll tear it down, clean it up for you, test fire it, and, you know, and I'll do it for X amount of dollars. And, and man, you'll be surprised how many people come to the door. Sure. Very cool. And um, because you said you were Vista Print King, um, yeah. I want to jump in here and talk about branding a little bit because that's, again, that's where I kind of come from. That's my wheelhouse. Um, so for those of you who are starting out, what Kip was just saying with the Vista Print thing, I find so, so, so important. And I know that a lot of people are going to be scratching their heads and saying, like, it's really not that important, but I truly believe it is. Um, yes. Part of this whole word of mouth thing, in my opinion, and this goes for any industry at all, but because this industry is so word of mouth driven, I think it's even more important. Um, part of part of that whole process is to create brand recognition, um, and that's kind of marketing jargon that you hear thrown around a lot. Um, yes. But the basic gist of it is, you want to make sure that you're presenting to the people that you're talking to a unified front. Essentially, you want your logo on everything. You want to make sure fonts and colors are exactly the same. You know, there. Are, a million different greens. Which green is yours? Which font? Are you Arial or are you Impact? Even if it's just that basic. Um, mm -hmm. You want to make sure you have things like a catchphrase uh, or a mission statement um, and carry those things as many places within your business as possible. Um, 
if you don't know where to get started on that side of the process, and a lot of people really kind of struggle with the logo side of things, because none of us really, I mean, how many of you listening here tonight are graphic designers? Probably not that many, you know. It's a very specific um, set of skills, and some people don't know where to look for that kind of thing. I'm here to tell you guys, it is super duper easy to find someone to make a logo for you. Um, there are people just like you getting started in the graphic in the graphic industry business. You can Craigslist for them, or you can go on Fiverr, F-I-V-E-R-R dot com, um, and sometimes they'll do a logo for five bucks if you want. You know, it'll be basic stuff, but really, really, um, it's worth the five or ten dollars to not have that headache. Um, there's another good one that I've used before. Elance has just changed its name to, I think, Upwork or Upworks. Um, that's another really good one to look for when it comes to things like logos and websites. Um, I can't stress the importance enough of wherever you go, you know, hand out that business card, make sure it has your logo on it, make sure it matches what you're, what you're trying to depict to people. Um, and when it comes to things like logos, th you know, your logo designer is going to say things like, well, what do you want this logo to say to people? You know, what, what, do you, what are you trying to get at, you know, with, this, with the design of this logo? So try to think, do I want to come across as um, professional or progressive or edgy or tactical or manly or, you know, you want to find as many adjectives as you can um, to describe uh, the feelings that you want people to have when they look at what you have to offer. Not, not just your services, I'm talking specifically about your website and logo and your look, you know. What do you want people to think about? Um, should it have a gun in the logo? Should it have um, something, some sort of um, patriotic symbol of some sort? You know, that's all completely up to you, and it will completely depend on what you want to depict um, to your audience. So, from a branding perspective, spend some time there. You know, it, I know that it's it, it's easy to just go on somewhere and pick a clip art version of something like that, but it's so easy to actually create a nice looking professional brand and it really will make a difference to people when you're out and about and talking to people. So that's just my little two cents on the, <laughs> on the brand. You're 100% right too. You're 100% right on that. Uh, with, with my local, I used to cross the ARs. Well, you know, how many times have you seen cross the ARs? Lots. Lots and lots and lots and lots and lots. So looking back at it, in hindsight, I really shouldn't have used the cross the ARs. Because, but the way I tried to set mine, if you look in that picture there, it kind of looks like an A. Because I call my business American Gunsmithing because I loved America and I love gunsmithing. And, and, and you were talking about your catchphrase. Well, my motto for my business was, I do it all, I do it right, 100% guaranteed. See? And, that, and that's that, the type of thing. If somebody asks you for, hey, what is it that you do, you know, you always have those things. If you're if you're grounded in your branding, you always have those things to fall back on. Or if somebody says, "Hey, um, we're going to give you this free ad space." Let's say let's say something like that happens. Hey, I'm a startup, little community, whatever. Here's a cheap ad space, and you want to take them up on it. Uh, what do we need to put there? What words do you want? You should immediately have a, an elevator pitch, you know, in mind for your for what you have to offer for what your business is. So whether it's that catchphrase that, that Kip's got, or if it's if you have kind of a mission statement or something along those lines, um, make sure that you abide by that. You know what I mean? You want you you want that to be in a lot of different places. You want people to understand that these are the things that you find important. So absolutely, absolutely. Um, what else? Did you do any networking on that? You know, I, 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 yeah, and, and that's what I was going to point on. I said, you know. Uh, being in the firearms business now, when I did this, it was in Tennessee, so Tennessee is a little bit more gun friendly, mm -hmm. and there's a lot of organizations up there. You have everything from the Wild Turkey Federation to the Deer Hunters Association, uh, Ducks Unlimited. You had the Quail Hunters. You had the uh, uh, Friends of the NRA at NRA banquets. I hit them all. Mm -hmm. I went to every function I could. I passed out cars. I gave away free gunsmithing gift certificates up to 150 to 200 dollars, uh, excluding parts, and would offer services such as that, so that that people would um, not only uh, want want that service, and but they they get to know you on a personal basis. You're supporting their organizations, and in return, they find out about you and they come help you, and it works. I'm telling you folks, it works. Absolutely. 
Absolutely. And, and again, um, if you give yourself a good brand to start with, people will start recognizing you at these places. You know, if you hand them a, a business card and they see, even if it is across, a, across Air 15s, <laughs> if you've got that brand recognition, that establishment going on, people are going to know who you are and they're going to say, oh, yeah, I remember hearing about you from X, Y, and Z. Um, yes. so, so these things all kind of work hand in hand. It does. In fact, it, I had American Gusfits on my truck. I had it on my shirts. I wore my yep. shirt so much that people thought that's the only thing I had to wear. So, you know. Yep. <laughs> but, that's, but that's, again, that's how you do it. That's exactly that's right. how you do it. Hey, you're your best billboard. That's you're your exactly best advertising. Right. That's exactly right. I, I totally it, agree with that. It, you know, and these things do cost a little bit of money. You have to make oh, yeah. that um that decision to to make those small investments it's not like these things are costing thousands of dollars except maybe you know if you're going to do a nice website e-commerce all that that might cost you a thousand dollars or a couple thousand dollars and that would be worth it but if you're talking about promotional materials and vista print um business cards which are totally totally fine um and t-shirts and things like that these are small investments that i think make a big impact when you're trying to get started and and beyond you know we we're We've got hundreds and thousands of graduates, you know, not hundreds of thousands, but hundreds and, and or thousands of students and graduates at any given time. Um, and we still wear those shirts everywhere. We still pass out the business cards. It's, it's an ongoing thing. You know, it's, you're showing yourself support. <laughs> so, um, yeah, that kind of thing is super important. Um, let me switch gears for a second here and talk a little bit about website stuff. Because I know that this can be the type of thing that people hate to talk about. Um, so I'm going to talk about it. <laughs> we, uh, at, For me, because my specialty has been more of the online side, um, when we're talking about branding and business cards and all of that, it's super important, in my opinion, this is new school stuff, to have a nice professional website, even if it's small. We're talking five-page website, a home page, about us, products and services, um, where you go for more information, maybe a fifth page like a gallery, you know, a gallery of past work, or if you have a blog, a blog, something like that. Five-page, easy-peasy, in and out. Uh, or it could be an, that last page could be an e-commerce, you know, a way to take PayPal payments or authorized.net payments, something like that. This is important. Um, in this day and age, and especially with all these new people buying guns and new people looking for gunsmiths, I think a website is, is really um, indispensable at this point. It's, it's so important to look professional, and, and if you don't have a website, or if you have a website that's been poorly done, or that hasn't been updated in five or ten years, um, you're, you're going to be missing out on people. A lot of people go to Google and say, what is it that I need? The word gunsmith and my zip code, you know, so gunsmith 32259 and see what pops up. Um, if you don't have a website, that you're not going to pop up on Google hardly at all. <laughs> so that's first and foremost. And that's a totally, but by the way, that the SEO and Google ranking, Google rankings thing is a totally different monster. Totally different monster. Um, and we won't get into that very much tonight. Google rankings. Um, is a full-time job and uh, and a full-time webinar. <laughs> so we'll yeah, we'll you can do a full hour on that. Yeah, um, <laughs> but from a website perspective, it's important to have your website. Um, and I know this sounds nitpicky, but wherever you have your website listed, wherever you have your business listed online, you need to make sure that your name, address, and phone number. And in the industry, they call that NAP, N-A-P, name, address, phone number. Um, all of those things need to be spelled out exactly the same way to the punctuation point. We're talking ST period versus S-T-R-E-E-T. -E -E it has to look exactly the same. It doesn't have to, but um, it's a ding if it doesn't. So, so keep that in mind as you're, as you're building these little online spots. You know, um, As I said before, if you don't know where to go for a website, a lot of people fall into the hole of, my nephew can build me a website for only $1,000. And then you never get your website because it's your nephew and you don't want to burn bridges. Um, look at all of your options when it comes to that type of thing. If you're tech savvy, a lot of places have super easy, cheap or free ways to do it. Wix, uh, WordPress, uh, Homestead, a whole bunch of them. Even um, GoDaddy itself has actually really nice looking template websites. So if you want if you want to go for like a nominal fee version of that type of thing, 
go for it. If you're tech savvy and you know you're going to be able to, you're going to want to maintain that thing on your own, go that route. Um, save a little bit of money, take it upon yourself to, to do it. But the most important thing is to actually do it. So think of it this way. Your billable hours as a gunsmith. If you think it's going to take you more than, I don't know, 10 billable hours as a gunsmith, take that money that you would have made and <laughs> dump it into somebody else building that website for you. Go on one of those websites I said before, an Elance or an Upworks or something along those lines. Find yourself a website developer, somebody who knows what he's doing um, and can uh, you know, customize a WordPress site for you or something like that. Take it off your own plate, hand it to somebody who is good at it. Um, once that's done, there is also a commitment on the back end that needs to happen for all business owners. And I truly mean all business owners, that you absolutely have to commit to showing people the best side of you. And that a lot of that has to do with what's on your website. Constantly update pictures on your website. Constantly um, go back and forth and say, hey, this is what we're doing now. This is what we're doing now. There are ways you can do that just on your website. Um, and then there are ways you can piggyback off of social media with that as well. We'll, we'll hopefully get into that a little bit later too. Um, now, because I've talked so much, Kip, <laughs> have you found, uh, tell me your personal experiences, and it can be totally different than what I just said, um, but because you've had experience for so long in the industry, tell me what you guys have done in the past website-wise, or if you've done websites or not done websites. I know that you've kind of run the gamut as far as sizes of business, you know, I'd love to hear any opinions you have, even if it goes completely against what I just said. <laughs> well, it doesn't. Um, in fact, my experiences with websites and websites was was a nightmare. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the try to do it on your own thing is just like, no, no way. Now, right. grand, grand, a lot of that's because my generation is not the computer generation. Um, you know, I'm old Generation X, but we um, just, just the way that it works is such a um, well. It's a skill. That's what it is yeah. now. It's it's not a it's not something you just put together and throw out there. And you can you can buy those. Hey, you can set your website up for nine dollars. But you know as well as I know uh, too, Jennifer, that that doesn't mean that you're going to get the rankings for Google search. That when people search you out, that it's going to pop up there in the top ten. Right. It doesn't yeah. work that way. And for me, it was very confusing. And we we tried that route, and we went with a a buddy or whatever you want to say. Uh -huh. and it was a nightmare. It was a wasted money. It was a it's a way time. to burn friends too. I tell you what. <laughs> yes, it was, and it really did. It caused a lot of problems, and, and it was just a it was a total total waste. And and it didn't come out the way I wanted. And I didn't like it. And that's that's pretty much how it ended, right there. Right. And and if I had it to do over again. I would just wait till I had the money and hire a professional, yep. somebody like yourself or Zeke, who knows what they're doing with that market. You know, that, that was his background too, and, mm -hmm. and yep. it knows how to to make that a success. Because uh, from a novice point of view, the one thing that I learned out of this, the lesson, and I'll tell this to the ones that are listening, is if you're in the same boat I was, you have to make sure that the person not only can deliver what they tell you they can deliver, but they're going to be able to do it the way you want it set up. And then you need to ask them, who is all going to see my domain? Who, who are you going to get my domain through? What is my rankings going to be? Uh, you know, how much is this going to cost me to be able to do that? Yep. And because Google is a monster. <laughs> it truly is. It truly is. And, and and, if you, and there is. There's stuff you can do on your own. Um, I would caution people when first starting out to uh, ha ha don't have your main goal be to immediately rank number one on Google. It will never happen. You can't. It's one of those no. those. Um, you know, my dad always said that you can have when it comes to things, you can have them fast. There are three options: um, fast, cheap, and quality. You can pick two of those three. You know what I mean? <laughs> um, and I feel like it's a lot the same when it comes to Google rankings. You can, except there are really only two options. You can complete the goal of being number one on Google. And I guess it is still three options. So you can meet the goal of being number one on Google. You can do it quickly, or you can do it cheap. You can pick two of those three things. <laughs> you know, yeah. um, for for people just starting out, it is a total grind 
to climb and claw your way up those Google rankings. But if you if you hire somebody else to do it, um, and this is this was my industry for a while. You know, the Google rankings thing is almost how I started out in marketing. Um, it's going to cost you an exorbitant amount of money to hire somebody on to actually complete that process for you. Because um, it really does, from a marketing perspective, it takes hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of ongoing man hours. You never stop. It is a constant battle um, to hit that algorithm in exactly the right way to get to number one and keep you at number one. So I would advise people who are just, you know, just starting out in the industry, first time you've got a website, first time you're, you know, hitting up your market, um, forget about Google rankings for a minute. People that are there right now are already established, even in a niche section like it, like gunsmithing. Um, the people who are number one right now have been doing this longer than you have, and Google takes and you know takes a big look at everything. And one of their one of the things that they look at is authority. Part of authority is how long have you been around. So if you're starting your domain JenniferMcGinnisGunsmithing.com, it's been around for one day. Um, Google's going to take a look at that and say, nope, and not legit, not going to put you on the top of the rankings. And it's just going to take time. So please be patient with that process. There's so many other things that you can do um, with your time and money other than freaking out about Google rankings. They will eventually climb. It will organically happen. It will take time. Um, I would advise against that need for immediate top ranking. I know that everybody says you have to be top in Google, and that's really as much of a sales ploy for those companies as, as it is anything else. Um, there are a million ways that you can get clients and customers without being number one on Google, and although it is nice to be there, it's a nice spot to, to be in, um, it should not be the most important thing that you're focusing on when you, when you first get started. Right. Um, what else? Have you, have you guys tried anything in your past from an online version? Have you done anything fancy? <laughs> have you guys, did you guys get into social media at all? Because we can talk about that a little uh, bit from an SDI perspective. But you know, from a gunsmithing perspective, tell me what you guys have tested the waters on. Facebook was about our biggest fancy thing. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was actually something that we had to learn about. But truthfully, it really worked out well for us. Uh, especially for me, I mean, people started connecting with me on Facebook. They started looking at the pictures like you see here. Uh, they found out I was a Smith, and we started talking back and forth. I met some other Smiths. We started talking back and forth, becoming friends, and started networking that way. Um, and that's really, I mean, I have to give a lot of credit. The Facebook thing worked out well for me, and uh, that's 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 how it was something that I kind of understood. And it could control. I could go in there every morning and, and check it. And I was getting messages. I was getting, you know, PMs, everything. Hey, where are you located? Can I send you a firearm? Can I do this? Can I do that? You know, it was working out really well for me. It really was. And I started doing, like, little giveaways and things like that when I go to the, the, uh, the uh, shot show. You know, you get all that cool stuff. Absolutely. And, I, and, 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 man, I had the mission when I went. I had this in my mind. I said, you know what? When I go out there, I'm going to carry back to this crap home. Oh, and yeah. I did. And I did. And I, it was in, the head, in my head all I'm going to do is for those that cannot get out there, I'm going to put a SHOT Show package together, and we're going to have a drawing. You, you have your friends like us and this and that and the other, and you get registered, and we were giving away this stuff. And, and man, it worked out great for me. It worked oh, out really good. That's a cool so, idea. You know, it didn't yeah. cost you any money, basically. No! <laughs> you know? No, man, you'd be surprised how many people want those little Glock keychains. Oh, yeah, absolutely. That's cool. <laughs> but, and, and I had uh, I had uh, some ends with some of the manufacturers, too. That I went through armors courses, and I got to know all of them really well. And, um, you know, God, I have to say, God, I guess it gave me a little bit of a gift in some way. It just seemed like that... Um, like the folks at Barrett and, and Glock and uh, a few others and the NRA people, we just all hit it off. Sure. And, and I got along with them and, you know, friendships developed and, and you know, it, it helped a lot, you know. And, and of course, I had I had friends that were in the industry that, that came from my little hometown. Um, uh, a lot of people remember the show Sons of Guns. Well, you know, SDI has a good friendship with the guys that, and Atlas, who took that over, 
And, and one of those guys who's a machinist for them, he's the head R&D, his name is Zach Hall. He's a good friend of all of ours. And, you know, Zach was a friend of mine before he ever got that job when him and I were both just a couple of uh, no names there in Columbia, Tennessee. <laughs> <laughs> and he got a call one day. He said, hey, come on down, try out, you know, for uh, the shop position. And he did, and they didn't let him go home. That's awesome. <laughs> so, I love talking about can. this industry. I tell you what, I hear this all the time from people all over the, the school here. Oh, I knew him from 25 years ago. You know, that's how that's how this all goes down. I'm, I'm telling you what, 90% uh, of the people that I think work for SDI, you know, in faculty and staff positions, knew somebody at some point, and that's, you know what I mean, they vouch for him and said, oh, my gosh, you have to see this guy. This guy would be an amazing instructor, blah, blah, blah. So I, I just I love that about the industry. Sure. Um, Sure, that's I that's how I got to meet Zeke was through Gabe. You yeah, know? yeah. And, and Gabe, Gabriel, Gabriel, uh, yeah, I'm talking about Gabriel Wren for those who yeah. don't know who I'm talking about. Gabe's a great guy. We were friends, and he was working at the uh, Northside Gun Shop, and, and James, the owner of that shop, was friends, and he introduced me to Zeke, and we became friends, and just things started blossoming from there. And, and um, you know, it, it's just that's how it works. And another uh, lady out there, Beth Bannis, or Beth Baca now, mm -hmm. she's married. Um, uh, Zeke knows her, and, and uh, Beth is just a. Uh, she helped out a lot too, and you know it, it's 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 a tight community is what I'm getting at. You know, for the people that are listening, you're going to find that the firearms industry is not uh, as you all know. It's not what we're portrayed to be, but it is a very close industry, and I, I can tell you this right now, just so you all know this: if if you do something wrong to somebody in this industry, that they're, they're going to know it. And especially when you get on the bigger scales of things, right. you know. And I was just as uh, I, I, what I consider a nobody, but they all made me feel like somebody. I mean, Chad Enos from from uh, Caltech and so many of those other guys, and, and just treat you like they've known you your whole life. And it's just, right. it's just uh, friendships bloom from there, and, and it's uh, it's really cool. It really is cool. So I, I'm very, I feel very blessed by it all. And that burning bridges point that you made, I think, is important, and it is kind of a good segue back into the social media thing. Um, people will, as much as word of mouth works in a positive way, it works in a negative way as well. Um, if you do a bad job, obviously everybody's going to know about it. <laughs> so, yes. Oh, yes. Um, you, yes. You, you know I've told you before, if you do, right. you do a great job for somebody, they might tell five people, ten people, but if you do something bad, they tell everybody in town. I know. <laughs> right. Right. So you have to be very careful from a quality of work perspective. And that same thing um, is applicable online. Um, so when you're talking about getting a Facebook page and, and posting to it, Frequently, and in fact, in fact, hold on, we're going to do a poll. Um, let me launch this really quick. I want to know for those of you who already, you know, who either already are at a firearms facility of some sort, or who are planning to start a business, do you already have a business Facebook page? Um, and for those of you who don't own one, um, totally fine. Obviously, you can't have a business page if you don't own a business. <laughs> but, uh, but I want to know for those of you who. Um, are in the industry currently, do you have a business Facebook page? Um, because I think it's important. So um, here's the thing about Facebook. It's free to set up and it's a free way to reach people unless you want to advertise, which I can talk a, a little bit about as well. Um, and it's important to always remember the tone that you're going for, the brand thing that you're going for, you know, the professionalism side of things. Um, because in the same way that if you put out shoddy work, if you put out shoddy messaging, um, people will not want to touch you with a 10-foot pole. You know, it's super important for you to figure out um, what your purpose is on social media. And I'm going to use Facebook as my primary, uh, you know, reference point here because that's a, a huge one right now. And it's a huge one for SDI. Um, when we went into building the SDI Facebook page, which did not exist four years ago, and we're up around 73,000 fans right now, um, the goal of the Facebook page was not to sell products and services and, you know, for us, programs and courses. The goal was never to sell anything. The goal for us was to create a place where people who might be interested in SDI for any reason, friends, family, people who are just interested in gunsmithing or firearms in general, a place for those people to go 
um, to find news on firearms, to ask questions, to interact in a fun way when it comes to the firearms industry, um, and for a way, you know, for a way to be accessible to students. So that was always the goal here, and I think that's a good way to look at it. You don't want to use your Facebook pages or any social media outlet outlets. Um, unless it's like a Yelp or a Manta where it's pretty much just an advertising spot, but I'm talking Instagram, um, Twitter, Snapchat, Facebook, all of those actual social media platforms. Um, don't look at that as a way to just advertise your services. You know, don't say, you know, if, if every single post is something like, we offer bluing, or we, here's 20% off, or blah, 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 blah. It, people are going to feel sold to, and that's not really the purpose of this whole thing. You can do that on your website. You can do that on your uh, newspaper ads, your banner ads places, you know. Um, the, the best stuff to put on a Facebook page when you're first starting out, first of all, make sure it's completely filled out. It's got all your contact information. It's got your mission statement, who you are, what you do. Um, and it's got a nice cover image and a nice profile picture. Those are the basics of starting up a Facebook page. Super easy. Um, beyond that, your posts should be consistent, meaning that you want to do it as often as you can um, and don't leave big, huge lapses between posts. Um, and you want to do things that are visually engaging. So my favorite things to do on our Facebook, I manage the SDI Facebook page. Um, and in fact, if you've reached out to the SDI Facebook page, you're probably talking directly to me. So. Um, so hi, and uh, it's important. One of my one of my favorite things to post on there are pictures of student work. I love the pictures of student work. That's just me being a you know a geek, a student geek potentially. But everybody else likes to see it too. So if you're a gunsmith, post pictures of the guns that you're working on. Post pictures of you know you interacting with clients. Go out and do stuff. If you're at range time and you run into somebody, oh my gosh, snap a picture and put it on your Facebook page and say it was so nice to see you. You know, those are fun things. Those are reasons for people to engage with you. That's you should you should be aiming for and now here's some stats for you. Um, on Facebook, small businesses should be aiming for um, depending on the size of your business and your fan base, anywhere from four posts a week to two posts a day. You don't want to go too much more than two posts a day, you know, unless you've got a huge, huge, huge following. Um, but you definitely want to do at least a couple a week. So make a goal for yourself. You know what? I'm going to post every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or I'm going to post every Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, or whatever the case may be. Um, try to keep it during the business week as well. Statistically, uh, weekend posts don't um, engage as well and they don't hit as many eyes. So that's a little, you know, insider tip. <laughs> but um, but business week posts tend to do better from an engagement perspective. Um, but make it a, make your make a commitment to yourself to put actually fun and interesting things up there at least a couple times a week. Um, if you're struggling with that kind of thing, uh, sit down once a month and troll some evergreen. You know, go around the internet. And I say troll, like from a fishing perspective, not from a being mean on the internet perspective. Um, look around the internet, find some evergreen pieces, some reviews that you agree with, something along those lines. Post one of those every once in a while. Something that you believe in and agree with um, that comes from somewhere else. Post that link somewhere. Put a one-liner, hey, this is what I think, this is why I think it. Put something like that on there once a week. You know, you bam, there's one of your four posts a week or whatever it is. Um, but Oh, here. Okay, so here's a good question, and this will segue into ads. I know we're running a little bit out of time, but we'll, we'll do this kind of quickly. Um, to have, quote, visually amazing ads, I'm guessing it requires a graphic designer and or photographer to make one, uh, potentially. So um, here's the thing about Facebook ads. They only let you do a very small number of words per Facebook ad in the picture itself, 20%. Um, and they'll actually not let you do a Facebook ad. Like they'll say, nope, that ad does not work for us if you have more than 20% words anyway. So, so let's say you wanted to run an ad. You don't have a graphic designer at your disposal. You don't want to hire one on for this project, although you absolutely could for pretty cheap. Um, find a picture that you go to. Okay, here are a couple little resources. Um, Photo Dune is owned by Envato, E-N-V-A-T-O, but Photodune is the actual uh, royalty-free stock image service. If you're just starting out, that's the cheapest one. It's you, you get what you pay for, so they're not the best images, but you can absolutely buy an image for five bucks. 
if you want. You know, slap that on your Facebook ad. It'll give you when you're building them. It'll give you a preview of what it's going to look like on, you know, on desktop, mobile, Instagram, if you link them, that type of thing. Um, so you can absolutely start small, um, even just with a picture of a firearm. Just make sure it's something that you can work on. I wouldn't put something on there, you know, to depict your what you have to offer that goes against what you have to offer. Um, but you can absolutely run an ad, a visually dynamic ad, um, just by buying a stock image of something and, and starting from there. Now, my recommendation, of course, would be to hire that out. Um, go to Fiverr, F-I-V-E-R-R.com, see what you can find. Um, a quick Google search, if you just type in what are the dimensions for a Facebook ad, you'll find a billion little posts that'll tell you what the actual like pixel sizes will need to be. Send that to your $5 developer, see what they come back with. It's worth the five bucks. You know, it's, a, it's $5. So um, those are types of things that you can play with that don't cost a lot of money um, that actually might make sense for you to do. Um, and, and just as a side note, I won't delve totally into Facebook ads, but there are different types of ads that you can do. Um, you may want to spring for a couple hundred dollars worth of a likes campaign, get, get some likes underneath your belt, you know, see. Uh, make sure that people are seeing those posts that you're doing. Um, I always think that's a good idea. And then when you're ready to get to the actual, what we would consider like a lead generation ad, which is where the money comes in. Those are the people that you reach out to and the people that you email. Um, you'll want to make sure that you have a place on your website to collect that information. So in a perfect world, you'll do a Facebook ad, um, optimized for what they call and you'll see if you ever want to mess with the stuff you have, if you have questions email me but if you get in there and you you look into an ad for conversions you'll want to send that to like a contact page on your website so that those people can put their information in there best way to do it um, and that's where you start building your your leads and everything so Samson I hope I answered that question and in fact um, before I dig myself in too much of a Facebook ads hole <laughs> ooh, that's uh, just to make sure I enunciated that ads hole um, I'm gonna go through some of these questions Kip and there were a couple in okay. here that I know that you will do better on than I will um, just one second here let me take a quick look there was something right at the beginning about when do you like basically switch gears from a gunsmith to a machinist you know what's the what's the cutoff point when you know you're supposed to be a machinist instead of a gunsmith type of thing type of thing yeah when do you stop being a gunsmith and become a manufacturer <laughs> Ronald asked that question long ago okay well first of all you have to follow what you what you want to do and what you desire to do machinists know right off the bat they're machinists uh, machinists is a lot different than gunsmithing and a lot different than gunsmithing machine work. Mm -hmm. Okay? A machinist is Can an individual. That? What's the difference between a machinist and a, and a gunsmithing, a well, gunsmith to gunsmith machine work? I'm just getting ready to go into that. Oh, good. A machinist <laughs> can take any piece of metal and make something of it. Okay? A machinist um, goes through a lot of schooling and there's a lot of math involved with machine work. Okay. It's part engineering. It's part mechanical. Okay, that's the best way to look at machine work. Machining, in fact, there's a picture of one of the best ones sitting right back there, that guy with that big Fu Manchu and that blue shirt. Uh, that's Zach Hall. Zach started out as machinist. Okay, he loved guns. Yep, you're circling in there. And he <laughs> loved he loved guns and he played with guns, but he was machinist before he was anything to do with guns. So what I'm getting at, guys, is is um, machinists look at the stuff we do in gunsmithing as relatively easy work, <laughs> yeah. and and uh, and that's because they're not just crowning an 11 degree angle on the tip of a, a barrel. They're not just you know doing it. They're they're actually taking raw steel and you know making a high dollar value part or something specific out of it that, that is so in precise and precision and mathematics it, it, it's, it's virtually a piece of engineering and that's what separates machinist from the gunsmith slash gunsmith machine shop now with that being said that's not belittling anything at all because the machine shop that we do in gunsmithing is not an easy task I mean you, you, there's a lot there to learn but 
it's really um, something that a machinist can do uh, while he's eating a bologna sandwich. Okay. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, it, it really is that kind of way. And when I had Robert in my shop, Robert who was the machinist for 35 years. And I would be out there, you know, doing my thing and stuff like that, and he'd watch me, you know, and he'd go, and what would take me 30, 40 minutes to do, he could do in 10. So that's that's the difference, uh, really. It's, it's the years of experience, the years of knowledge. You know, when they start out in their school, it's all about formulas, mathematics, precise measurement, and knowing the metal, how knowing metallurgy, uh, how to how to deal with the metal. Whereas in gunsmithing, we look at things more like um, you know heat treating and doing some TIG welding and doing some uh, turning of a barrel or threading a barrel or you know uh, uh, refining uh, uh, an action in a uh, bolt action rifle, that kind of things. That's about the extent of what we do, you know. Other than maybe you might make a a, a a silencer, if you will, uh, but that's about as technical as it goes. And machine shops, uh, the machinist does a lot more intricate work than that. Awesome. Okay, <clears throat> here's a little bit of a different. We're going to switch, you know, topics here for a second. Um, Dale asks, uh, "Do hours of availability matter?" So in Dale's case, he works Monday through Friday. Um, he's off work around three or five, like somewhere between there. He could basically just run this on the weekends and maybe even evenings. Um, is that okay? Does that kind of thing work when you're sure. setting up? Listen, people don't care what hours you work as long as they get their gun fixed. They understand <laughs> that. And especially if you tell them, say, hey, look, I still work full time. I do this part time, so I'll be doing it in the evenings or on my weekends when I can get to it. And, and don't lie to people. If it's going to take you three weeks, tell them it's going to take me three weeks. Yeah. They're okay with that. They're okay with that. Now, a lot of times they want to come hang out and watch and that kind of thing. That's that's going to be up to you whether or not you want that. You may not when you first start out because you want to concentrate. And that's okay, too. But, you know, you just have to um, – uh, you have to make those decisions for yourself. Everybody's different is what I'm getting at. Uh, me, it didn't bother people to watch. It's like that rifle you see right there. That was a hand-painted rifle that I did for an individual who won, in my opinion, more of an artistic <laughs> look to his sure. gun. Yeah, but obviously. That, but that's yeah. what he wanted. It's, it, you can't see it in that picture, but the leaves have little, the little tiny detailed veins and everything else. Yep. In them. And that was something that he wanted done. Well, that's what he got. And remember this, guys. And no matter what we think of what they want done, hey man, <laughs> that's the coolest thing you've ever heard of. Uh huh. Hey, I hope the guy who who wanted that gun isn't on this webinar right now. <laughs> oh no, no, he's a I, he's a good friend of mine. He still loves it. He still loves it. You know, and he didn't care. He just he just said it's a, it's the prettiest gun he ever owned. So that's that's all I want to hear. That's so funny. and uh. Okay, stuff that's painstaking like that. Obviously, there's a lot of love that goes into that type of gun, you know. Yes. Um, that kind of goes on Dale's second question here. Since it's a second income, is the amount of time I put into it what I will get out of it? Or should there be an expectation there of you're going to work long hours for not very much money, you know, when you're getting started? How does What should well, they expect when it comes to that? Look at it this way. You're gaining experience. Mm -hmm. Okay. When you're first starting out, you're gaining that on hands experience. You need that. You're getting a word of mouth spread. So even though you may not make a lot in revenue, the the return that you're making now, as far as the word of mouth, the reputation, the the uh, um, name that you're building for yourself, money money can't buy that. And and you got to start out somewhere, right? So yeah, you take a few hits when you first start out, but don't be afraid to sell yourself either. If you know you can do the work, and you know it is, charge them. You know, I tell I tell all gunsmiths out there right now. In fact, I'm working on something right now. It's a project that Zeke and I have been working on for a while, and uh, it covers a lot of the pricing thing. But but don't sell yourself short. You have to sell yourself in your demographic. You know what people around you can afford. But man. Charge some money if, if you're, you know, if you can legally charge money. Charge the money that's appropriate for what you're doing. Will you lose? Will you? I mean, because sometimes it's going to be you. 
it's not going to be the money amount. You might say, let's say you charge to put a part in and it's uh, 30 bucks. Well, that's about right, but it took you six hours to do it because you've never done it before. Well, that's not the customer's fault. That's you. Yeah. You're having you're having to learn those steps, but guess that what? But guess what? The next time you get that same model gun in there and you have to do that, you'll have it done in 30 minutes. Okay. Right. <laughs> so, so, yeah, that's, that's actually that a really good point. You know, you, you have to, it's not the customer's fault <laughs> that you're yeah. just now le you're learning through this stuff. So, yeah, I, I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, right. Here's another one that I know that you're going to have insights on. Um, what kind of space do I need to get an FFL working out of my house? I think he basically means, you know, your regular run-of-the-mill startup. What do I do if I want to start charging money for stuff? You know, what kind okay. of space do you need in your house? Have you got a house? Uh, it says house, yep. Okay. Have you got a garage? I don't know. See, what I'm getting is, what I'm getting is, they don't care. You can do it on your kitchen table, they don't care. Okay? They just want you to know that you're going to be able to keep your records straight. That's what they care about. Okay. They want to know that you're going to do this and you're going to be steadfast at following the laws and doing what's right to make things like what we just had happen in Orlando not happen. Okay? They're they're looking for that kind of thing. They want to know you're going to follow the, the letters of the law to the T so that nobody slips up and gets their hands on a firearm or you repair a firearm for someone that you know you shouldn't do it for. Point in case. Um, I'm going to do a gun and the guy comes in and says, yeah man, this has been the coolest gun I have. You know, I never thought I'd have one until I got out of prison. Well, I that the red flag goes up. I can't work. <laughs> right. <laughs> whoa, whoa, whoa! I'm not touching your gun. Get out what? of my house. Yeah. You know, take get out and go now. You know, and and they, and they will cover. And believe it or not, the, the, for those who listen to me, they will cover those scenarios with you. Okay, they will tell you what you can do because you will be surprised at what your FFL. Um, it, it it's one of those situations where you have a right to deny to anybody for anything and good luck trying to sue you because that's not going to happen. Right. The, the ATF stands behind you 100% on that. They say if you got a gut feeling that there's something wrong there and you say no, that's, that's just the way it is because that's federal law. Yeah. And, and, that, and that's what they're looking for, guys. That's what they're looking for. They're looking for common sense. They're looking for people who are going to gonna follow the rules and are going to do the paperwork the right way and keep the paperwork straight and make sure that you know what the laws are so you're not doing nothing illegal. Right. And and no, they don't come pounding on the door at the middle of the night. <laughs> in fact, in all the, the three years or four years, I've changed my licenses over. I've changed locations. I have never been inspected one time. Right. So this and usually they're nice guys. You know, we've had people chime in tonight, even like, "Hey, my my ATF guys were really cool." You know. So yes. They, listen, I have not met a bad ATF person yet. The only time <laughs> the ATF people are bad is when you've messed up. Okay. Right. Right. And, and, and we have, in fact, in fact, we have on staff now somebody who has spent many years with the ATF. Yep. So, you know, it's 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 one of those deals where. Um, I have never been in fear of the ATF. I am not in fear of the ATF. I have found them nothing to be uh, afraid of. In fact, I have been more, uh, uh, how do I say this, more, uh, well, they're a little slow sometimes. Sure. <laughs> so sure. that's about the only complaint I have about them. But whenever I've called that phone and whenever I've asked a question, I've never been mistreated bad. They, they do their best to help me out. If they don't know the answer, they get an agent who does, and right. I get a call back. And they do nothing but respect you for that. So to answer his question, you don't need a lot of space to do to have your FFL. They don't care. They just want to know that you're going to do your paperwork and follow your rules right. As long as your county and your city says you can have your little FFL business there, then they're good with that. Okay, you'll have to have your city, your county license, and you know that's that's what you need to know. You need to know what your zoning is, and that's what it is. If that's all in check, you're gonna get your you're gonna get it unless you have something in your background. Great, cool. Now I know we're over time, but I do have a couple more questions here, Russell and Jeff. I want to get to I want to at least address yours, and then there are a couple other here's that are uh, that are talking about specializations. So. 
Um, if everyone's okay with sticking around for a couple minutes, we'll just fire out a couple more questions before we call it for the night. Um, two people chimed in almost at exactly the same time when we were talking about Facebook, um, specifically talking about like the political side of Facebook as an anti-gun entity. Um, we at SDI, we're a gun school. You know, we at SDI have never had a single post deleted. We've never had anything taken down or flagged. I run Facebook ads with guns on them. You know, none of that has ever caused a problem. However, I do know um, it, it's absolutely valid that if you're trying to buy or uh, rather sell a gun on Facebook, let's say you're in Swip Swap and you put a gun up, you're going to get flagged. You're going to get taken down. You know, that, that's, that's against their policies for selling things. I get that. Um, but what we're talking about is promoting a gunsmithing business on Facebook, which is totally legit and okay. So if you're scared about doing that, um, I wouldn't list firearms for sale on Facebook because that goes against the policies and procedures. But you promoting your firearms business, they have absolutely no problem with. Even if you think they're, you know, lefty anti-gun people, Maybe they are, but when it comes to gunsmithing and firearms businesses, you are A-OK. -okay. Just don't sell firearms. You know, don't go specifically against what they're talking about. I'm t we are active, active, active on Facebook. We have lots of partners who are active, active, active on Facebook. Nobody I know other than Hickok45, and that was Google, has ever had a problem. Um, so don't let that scare you. Don't fall for the shenanigans that are going around right now and use that as an excuse to not grow your business online. We, do, we don't want that. We want you to be smart. We want you to look at this and say, I can play by the rules. I own a firearms business. I own a gunsmithing shop. Um, I don't necessarily need to actually sell the gun here. That's, that's what I said before. That's not what it's for anyway. You know, well, that's, that shouldn't be your primary goal anyway. Do that on your website. Do that in your shop. Um, from, from a Facebook perspective, though, you can absolutely keep yourself out of hot water regardless of what your viewpoint is on Facebook and uh, and make sure that your people, your fans and friends are seeing what they need to see without getting yourself banned or, you know, without ruffling any Facebook feathers. There, There's absolutely a way to walk that line. Like I said, I've never even had a side eye cast at me as far as Facebook goes um, from, a, from a gun perspective. So keep that in mind. Don't let that stop you um, from promoting yourself on Facebook. That's what I'll say about those two things. And then, um, Kip, here's a question directly for you. Like a doctor, can you specialize in a certain area, or is it important to be able to do it all? That's what Ken asks. Sure. If you want to, if you want to uh, specialize in one area of field, that's fine. Uh, but you're going to be narrow to what you're going to make. I mean. Um, that's 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 a subject that, that I would say this: if you're going to make yourself to where you're doing one thing and one thing only, I would make sure that it's something that's going to be under big demand and that's going to keep you backed up. Say like um, custom turning barrels or something like that, you know, or building building a uh, uh, rifles or something of that nature. Uh, that might work, uh, but really, I feel. As a gunsmith, you should be able to do it all. Um, you, you, the, the average person who comes to your door, you don't know what they're going to bring. They're going to bring everything from from you know revolvers to to automatics to maybe even machine guns. You don't know what's going to come to the door, and if you don't know how to fix it, they're going to go somewhere else. So you need to, uh, that's uh, that's my opinion on that. Yep, and that makes that makes sense to me. I know you've mentioned that before, but um, here's something I don't know the answer to, or I, I don't have an opinion on really, or I don't have the, probably the right opinion. Um, when doing your gunsmithing, you know, part time, where what do you put like on? It says on your application. I think they mean everywhere. Um, what should you put for your business hours if you don't work on guns necessarily every day or keep regular business hours? Do you have an opinion on that? Well. Uh, if you have an FFL, you're going to have to list business hours, whether you buy by them or not. Oh, that's what he you means know. then. He said application. That's exactly what he was talking about. Yeah, about you, you're going to have to do that. Now, that doesn't mean you have to be there during those business hours always. Uh, the reason they want business hours is because they want to know that if they need to talk to you or if they want to come visit you, 
that they can they can come during those hours. That's what they'll do. That's 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 another thing I should have talked on earlier. When they want to come do an inspection or they just want to come by the shop, or whatever, they will call you ahead of time and make an appointment. They will they will know what your business hours are and they'll show up during those times. But they won't come pound on your door in the middle of the night. But yes, you do need to put some hours down of what your hours would be. Um, you know, you you have to decide how you want to do that. What I what most guys I know have done if they work during the day is they do an evening hour. You know, it might only be for four hours a night, but they they put them down. Hey, uh, Wednesday through Saturday, I do it from this to this, and that's sure. that seems to work just fine. Yeah, that's a good idea. Okay, good. Couple more, and then we'll be done. Um, how do you determine the amount to charge, and is it better per job or per hour? And if hourly, what rate? You know, what's your structure there? You know, that's that's the big question. And I know. I know there's nothing. There's nothing out there, and I know that um, it works both ways. Sometimes it's better by the hour. Sometimes it's better by the rate. Um, I will tell you all this that we are working on that. And that's all I'm going to say right now. But that will. But when we get done, that will be available to anybody who. Uh, past or present, uh, if it works the way that, that I hope that Zeke and I are trying to work it, it will mm -hmm. be available to our alumni, so as cool. well as our current students. So that's something I'm working on. It's taking a lot of time, as you can imagine. It does a lot of research. I'm having to talk to a lot of different people on that. Cool, very cool. Um, and actually, somebody chimed in and said Brownells has a survey of average prices, and I believe um, there are a couple different places. I've Googled this before. Um, a couple different places that'll do that as well, average right. types of things. But yeah, that that resource would be super cool. Um, well, let me let me go out and just say this. So if you are working as a gunsmith, uh, the cheapest and, it, and this goes for the most rural area, charge no less than thirty five dollars an hour to start. Right. Period. Your 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 knowledge, your skills, and your time is worth money. Okay. Right. So. Well, that's, I mean, think about auto mechanics, uh, you know, or anybody else that does any sort of hourly, you know, you're not going to get anybody to do hourly work for less than $35 an hour, much less skilled work that not many people know how to do. Right. You know? Right. Um, let me see. Yeah, let me, Go ahead. Let me, touch, let me touch on one more thing like that because I want okay. to be protected. I want you all to be protected. So if you're listening, I want you to listen very close to what I'm going to tell you. Give yourself a sign, whether it's in your garage or, or if you do something for someone, you have a shop minimum of $25 or you set the price to what you want it to be because you will have those individuals out there that will bring you a gun and want you to diagnose it for them and then they'll say they can't afford it right now then they'll go fix it themselves. Beware of the shopper. They're out okay. there, folks, and make sure that you get... Now, how I did this was I had a shop minimum, and I would tell them, okay, this is what it is, but it's a bare minimum for me to diagnose this is what it costs. However, if you decide to have it repaired, I will add that to the bill so you're not, you're not out that 25 bucks or whatever. Great way to do it. Absolutely. So. And that's standard procedure across a bunch of industries, too. So don't feel bad about doing that kind of thing. You know. Yeah. Protect yourself because you will have people that want you to tell you how to fix their gun so they can go do it exactly. or what part to get. Good. Um, last question here, and if I missed anybody, I'm going to go back through these after the webinar. If I've missed anybody, um, I'll, I will see if we can get something else together with Kip, just a little follow-up, and I'll email it to people. And There have been a couple questions also on actual programs and courses with SDI. Um, I will address those things separately, so look for an email from me. There were a couple of you in here, Russell, particularly. I want to make sure that you get some good answers to those questions because they're very in-depth questions. Um, but what kind of, what is this, um, let me, let me, let me see here. Ah, what kind of FFL do they need to get, and is that something, and this is my question, is that something they need to go into, a, you know what I mean? Give yourself a disclaimer if you're not 100% sure, you know. Well, first of all, I'm not a lawyer, and I'm not a representative of the ATF. There you go. <laughs> I, can, I can only tell you, I can only tell you what I know. That, that pertain to me or what I do know. What I will tell you this is anything you want to know about FFLs, you can find out for free in the Q&A section of the ATF uh, website. Uh, 
Okay. And they'll, they'll be happy to tell you all the different ones and what they mean. Now, the average person who does gunsmithing has an O1 license. An O1 license allows you also to sell firearms. It's the same thing that your gun store has. And your pawn brokers, they have them too. Now, what that does is that allows you to work on firearms or sell firearms. That's your very basic level. That's all you really need to be a gunsmith. If you're wanting to go further than that, if you're wanting to manufacture or you're wanting to deal with machine guns and things, there's other licenses that are in place that you'll need to do, and they can cost upwards of a lot of money, especially if you're going to do like manufacturing and things of that nature. But your average gunsmith won't use those. You just get a plain 01. It'll cost you the $200, $90 to renew it every three years, and that will usually just do you for anything you want to do other than manufacturing or class three weapons. Okay, good to know. And and also just a little side note, if anybody is completely freaked out about that application process, um, we do have a little partnership type of thing with FFL123.com who does like a little digital step by step walking through your, your FFL application thing. Um, you can buy it at a discount at the SDI website. Way down at the bottom of the home page there's a teeny little thing that says shop. We'll make it a bigger deal, you know, when we have more stuff in there. But um, for now, you can pick up one of those. They are a digital kit. Do not expect anything in the mail. You'll actually just have access to to an account type of thing. Um, but you get them, I think, for they're usually I want to say forty bucks, and you get them for twenty five on the SDI site, something like that. So, um, so if you're completely freaked out and really, really need help with that application <laughs> process, you can do that. Um, Don't be scared. Heard, <laughs> yeah, I've heard it's, it's probably not that bad. You may want to test it out first, and if you can't figure it out, you know, maybe go buy the kit. But, um, but I've heard it's not that bad. So just no. throw that out there in case you needed it. People love to tell war stories, make things worse than what they really are. Right? It's a questionnaire. It's not the FFL application process. Uh, yeah, they they just misery loves company is what it is. <laughs> so well, great. I, we're going to wrap it up. I know a couple questions came in these last couple minutes. Let me take a look at them and I'll get with Kip on the side and we'll see if we can't just email each of you. You know the questions that uh, the little last couple questions or any questions that I've missed. I'll see if I can't get something going. You know on the back end. So. Um, thank you so much, everybody, for, for hanging out with us. Even I'm, We're 20 minutes over, so I truly appreciate it. We've still got 50 people here, which is insane. So thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, we really like doing these things, and I hope you guys got something out of it. If you do have any questions on the programs or courses that we offer, hit up admissions at sdi.edu. Um, if you have any questions about the webinars, or hey, if you have an idea of a topic for, of a webinar or something you'd like me to go over at some point down the line, shoot me an email, jennifer at sdi.edu. That's J-E-N-N-I-F-E-R at sdi.edu. Um, we do these just about every last Tuesday of the month, so keep an eye out for next month as well. Um, oh, thank you so much, Carrie, for asking me that question. I always tell people this, and this webinar, I didn't say anything. We will absolutely, I have recorded this webinar. We will absolutely be posting it to our YouTube account, and I will then link, I'll put that link up on our Facebook page as well. So keep an eye out. Give me a couple days, you know, we've, in case um, there's a big, you know, break at the front or something like that. I, I always try to lay my ears on them one more time before I post them. Give me a couple days. I'll have it up on the YouTube page and the Facebook page as well. So keep an eye out for that. Kip, thank you so much, sir. I appreciate it. It was a pleasure as always. I enjoy <laughs> doing them. And, and those of you who have Kip as an instructor, you're lucky people. Let him know if you have any questions. <laughs> uh, go All study. Right. Study. Yeah, that's right. There you go. Yeah, you want to put any plugs in? Make sure you hit the books. <laughs> yeah, that's 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 my thing. You know, I my students, I make it clear. When you turn in your week's assignments, go back and reread the material and study, it, absorb it into your brain because there's a lot of things in there that one day you're gonna come back and say, I know where to have that, and keep your books <laughs> for references. Awesome. <laughs> All right, everybody, have a great night, and thank you again for, for joining us. We really enjoy doing these things. Thanks, everybody.